to this episode of the I Hate Matt Wall Poetry Podcast, where today you are going to hear the uh, shit recording I made of the um, zine panel at the Bombay Beach Lit Fest and um, hear the Q&A. As you know, hopefully, um, I posted a... Uh, vlog of the shenanigans that went down at the Bombay Beach Banali, um, which was the whole weekend. The Lit Fest was just that one day. So there's, I'll, I'll link it somewhere in here or some shit. So you could go look at all that stuff. It was basically um, me getting drunk, making a friend, running around town, doing dumb shit, then waking up way too early, a bit rough. So that, that's what all that is. Um, so there will be a link for that. Oh yes, I didn't film anything for the vlog because this thing, the actual panel for the Lit Fest, it didn't get like fucked up by any means, but the person before us ran long. We had to, like people had to go in like three or four times to get them to wrap up what they were doing. So our time was cut short. So I didn't end up reading a ton of stuff. I read one poem and um, Jonas read um, a, a little bit out of his zine he had there. And I think I have all of that. I think I have everything he read. God, I hope I do. Didn't record like the first half of his presentation, which was really good. And I'm really pissed that I missed the first half because that was gold. I mean, the whole thing was good, but the first half, I, I really thought he was, like, nailing it. And then um, something happened, and I don't know if I bumped my phone or if I, like, if it, I don't know what happened. It stopped recording. Once I realized it stopped recording, I started a new recording. So, whatever. Like, there's little cuts and weird stuff. I'll try to make it sound as... Um, together as possible on here. And then at the end, there was an amazing Q&A where the people there were asking great questions. So um, you will hear all of that. I am still going to be on the East Coast in May. There are dates available, I guess, if you want me to come to your area over there to do a workshop, um, a reading, a um, a panel of any kind, you know, whatever. If you have anything for me, let me know. And um, dates and all that stuff will be coming up shortly. And I'll po I'll talk about it at the end too, but what the fuck is happening at my new chat book? It's selling great over on the Etsy shop. Run over there and get a copy. There are uh, 40 copies of this. The first 20 signed, um, 17 poems, 32 pages. Get it. On with the zine panel. So, but they start as little zines, which I find really awesome. They don't have to be comics. They can be mixed media. So, Mari Naomi is another amazing um, writer, creator, artist. Um, this was actually a zine, and then she turned it into um, a mixed media memoir that was sold through a publisher. So what I'm trying to say is like, you can start off small, you can experiment, you can actually create what you need to create, and then, you know, organically through the culture of Zine Fest, something could happen, the publisher might come and look at your stuff, might want to pick you up, maybe not. That's not the whole point. The whole point is to get your work out there. Um, the other thing that's really fascinating is like, film studios are actually embracing zines. Um, so A24, I'm sure you all have heard of, heard of A24 before. But they started getting into the zine culture, which is really interesting. I'm kind of conflicted. It's kind of cool, but it's also, you know, it's really interesting. They're making super high-end zines, which to me is kind of interesting. Um, this one's about Brendan Fraser when he started making uh, his comeback with The Whale. Um, this is another one, Uncut Gems. You can kind of see on the right, it's very mixed media. There's like some fake ads, there's some prose in there, there's some short stories. Um, and you can just go to the A24 site and like buy a bunch of them based on my films. Um, which is kind of cool um, if you're really a fan of a specific film and you want to get a little bit more about, you know, some art around that. 
Um, the other thing that's really fascinating with the proliferation of social media in the past 15 years is it's enabled creators to basically share their zines with the world through online, through Zine Fest, through Zine Distro, small presses, and Zine libraries. It's actually how Matt and I got connected. I couldn't, I couldn't figure out who, to, who else to get down here as a Zinester, and so I contacted my folks at SF Zine Fest. They reached out to people at San Fernando. They hooked me up with Matt, and it's kind of how Zine Fest and Zine Culture yeah, kind of works. Really. Um, so this is what Zine Fest looked like. There's thousands of people. Um, the bottom right is San Francisco Zine Fest. This one used to be in Golden Gate Park. They moved it to the Metreon. Um, and I tabled there a few times. I think there's like three, 400 creators and zinesters, and there's like, I think last year they had like 6,000 people in one day. Um, so. Are you rubbing it in? No, what I'm trying to say is like, <laughs> what I'm trying to say is like, there's spaces for you to be able to put your work out there, um, and you don't always have to go to the traditional route through a publisher. Um, and it also is a little bit low pressure because like you can actually talk to someone and I'll get to that in a moment. This one was Houston on the left. Um, this past uh, October, I went to this one. This cool, like, weird abandoned warehouse. It was their 30th anniversary of Zine Fest in Houston, which is awesome. It's been happening since the 90s. Um, table, that's my table on the right. But, you know, all these things are pretty awesome. But, like, why are they really fucking cool? Is because you can express yourself, no gatekeepers, and it does this thing which I, you know, really love, and Matt can speak to this, we were just talking about this earlier, but like, it presents groups that have been dismissed with an opportunity to voice their opinion. So zine festivals and zines turn invisible communities into embodiments. You know, I'm a white male, they usually basically prioritize people in the LGBTQ community, people of color, to get their voice out there first, and if there's still room in Zine Fest, then they'll open it up to everybody else. And I, and I really appreciate that because, again, it turns invisible communities into embodied ones. Um, the other thing about Zines and Zine Fest is like it really, really emphasizes personal connection between the creator and the reader. You're literally standing there at a table selling your work over and over and over and over again, trying to get people to come up to you and talk about your work. You may have stuff spread out, you may have them read stuff, um, and basically, you kind of see what works. Kind of try to understand like what part of your work really sells, really catches people. Um, and I've been going to Zine Fest for many years, for like 10, 15, but I actually started making them during the pandemic because one, I didn't feel confident in my writing. Went to UCR. What's up, UCR people? Um, and I got a little more confident in my in my writing, and then I, I started making them. Um, this is one that I made. This was based off of nonfiction. Um, what's weird about this is um, I did this a few years ago. And the imagery here is actually AI generated. I had no idea where that shit was gonna go with AI and art. So I'm, I only made like 10 of these and I probably will never make another batch because I just felt so conflicted given like where everything's gone with it. Um, I wanted to be super abstract. So given where the technology was at the time with AI, like you can't really tell what it is, where it's from. And I, I love that about it. And I just used words from my nonfiction to generate that stuff. But I will never probably use AI. <laughs> um, this is another one. This is a collection of short stories that I made. This is actually um, out here if you want to buy it. But you can start to see on the right that there's places that actually start carrying these. And I'll get that into a little bit. So like, who can make zines? Like, you can make zines. If you don't know, you can actually take one page of paper and turn it into a zine. Um, you can Google this. But a lot of people start out with this, just try to understand like the format of it. Um, and Believe it or not, it's really easy. You can go and like print out a bunch of shit at your work if you can get away with it. You know, you can go to. There's a Marxist work, word for that. What is it? Expropriation. Expropriation. <laughs> they, they've taken your time and soul, so you get Yeah, I print out shit all the time at work and do this. Um, you can go to FedEx, Kinko's. You know, there's also free printing at most libraries. Yeah, you can do that as well at the libraries. Um, and you can do it, like I said, printer copy machine, and then like, what happens if you don't have access? You kind of mentioned this, the library, but you have other resources. There's like community centers, there's distros, there's art centers. Um, I was just talking to Matt about this one, and so, and, and David, this is WSD, this is out in um, Phoenix, the Waste of Ink Distro. It's, it's pretty awesome. It's a distro, what's that? A distro is just like a, like a place where they, I'll actually show one of it internally, but like, 
they'll have like a library, they'll have like stuff to sell, they'll have like an area for you to donate your zines. Um, and so it's just a it's just a community center that allows for that creativity and that art to be is to happen. Most of these are grant run. Um, and so yeah, what do you do with your zines? You can share it with your friends, you can sell it online or in a bookshop. I have zines at Silver Sprocket up in San Francisco. This is in the mission. Um, they're a comic store, but they sell a lot of zines. If you believe it or not, the whole bottom right is all zines um, from local creators. So you can go in there. You can go to most bookstores that are indie, and you'd be like, hey, I want to consign my zine. You guys have a zine section, and most of the time they will. Um, they'll usually do like 70, 30, so you'll take 70%, and they'll take 30 or something. Um, but it's a good way for you to have your stuff um, in stores, you know, get it into somewhere local. Um, these are mine uh, down in San Diego, so verbatim, or this other one, uh, Badio, like they had one there. Um, you can donate to a zine distro, like I was mentioning, so Wasted Ink zine distro is pretty fucking amazing. I love this place. I go it every time I, I'm visiting Phoenix. Um, yeah, you can sell your stuff, but then one of the coolest things is you can actually donate your zine to their zine library so that anybody can have access to your work who can't afford a zine. Um, even if the zine is five bucks, that, that may be still too much for someone. Um, so on the left there, that's basically their zine library. You just go there, you just hang out. Um, hopefully you're, 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 you're volunteering or doing something for them as, as just part of the community of zine. But most zine distros, um, yeah, you, you donate them. You know, San Diego also has one. It's a mobile one. Uh, it's in a cool little Vida bus. Um, I was mentioning this to Matt. Like, I was down there at some like kind of like open event that they had uh, that around cool bookstores. They just had this, so I was like, sure, I'll donate mine. This thing just travels around. It's me in there. They have a bunch of zines in here. Um, and again, it's just really about giving some of your stuff if you can afford it to purchase other people's. It's kind of also, um, and then I just mentioned being able to table, but. Have fun, make zines, there's like little pressure on it. You can obviously try to create more and more and do and do what you like with them. Um, but let's read some zines. So I'm gonna pass it over to Matt. Um, and basically, let me just go <coughs> you. I don't know if you wanna stand up or if you wanna <coughs> read from there, it's up um, to you. But let me do a little, yeah, little no, bio, okay. unless yeah. you wanna. No, I mean. Yeah, so Matt's cool. a writer, musician, filmmaker, artist out of Los Angeles. He started his career fronting the punk band Creeperson. Oh, wow. Pronouncing that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and had a prolific film career under the name Creep Creeperson. I want to talk to you about that. That's fucking an amazing name. Um, he's written many novels, short stories, and collections of poetry. He's the editor of Blood Rag and Bloodshed Review. He's a former editor of Weird Mass and the Time Machine, uh, Time Mazine, I should say. And he also founded the Poetic Anarchy Press in 2021 and has a podcast, I Hate Matt Wall Poetry. So many can talk about as well. All right. Cool. So here's some zines. You can catch them outside as well, but yeah. Can't uh, do, that. do you want me to just read or you do you want to hit some stuff? Want. Yeah, okay. I just want to make sure to give you some space for you um, to read a few zines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so, but maybe I should do something. So, like, <laughs> just real quick, like, um, the, uh, I'm going to read some desert here, but uh, like one thing that like I do limited runs of everything, and so like this one, the off the grid one, like I wrote the title and my name on it in a different way, so every one is different. Um, and then like the drinking less one, I um, had a stained wine glass that I would put on each one, so each one was different. And, Shit like that. So you can have fun with it and do weird little shit. But um, I did want to kind of get into, um, what do you call it, the history of a little bit of stuff here too. And um, let me see. I'm going to have to find a place with better light. Sure. You know what? I can, I can turn this on. You good? Yeah. Oh, there's, <laughs> there. there's only like one plug. Looks like you have an idea now. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, where was I at? Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. So, I mainly do poetry, but I have a lot of short story scenes and short too, but, um, so this is called The Nuts of a Ground Squirrel. Um, 
sitting here, laptop on my lap, typing away. I hear rustling outside in the trash. Look out the screen door, see a ground squirrel digging a hole, placing something in, covering it up, and rustling again. It's in the trash, <clears throat> collecting my scraps for feasting later. I never noticed it before, but that squirrel has balls. A little tiny furry sack of nuts hanging between his legs. He stands up on two legs and looks at me indifferently and goes back through the trash. I get up and look at him and he stands up out of the trash on his two legs with a damn pretzel stick hanging out of his mouth like a fucking cigar. Motherfucker, I say, and he takes off bouncing over the sand through the fence with that stogie hanging between his lips. Why can't I dig through trash cans with no clothes on, with my balls hanging out, looking at others indifferently? It's because of our upbringing and our pretend religious guilt. I hate that squirrel because of who he is and who I am not. In the distance, the squirrel stands up on his two legs again, grabs the pretzel from his mouth, and blows out a perfect smoke. So that's kind of the shit I do. But, uh, oh, there's so much. Do you want to hit, hit a question or something that you said you wanted to talk about? Because yeah, I, I, like, I just could read forever, but like I want to talk as much about this. Yeah, we could maybe we could transition to, to talking a little bit. I was going to read, but... Um, you know, I can just kind of show you guys, and you can pick it up, but I made a zine um, from a short story um, that I wrote a year ago, a year and a half, and um, I ended up turning it into a short film, so, um, you know, seeing what A24 kind of did, I, I basically started, um, I put the short story in here, I put like the movie poster, um, I took some stills from the, from the film in here, and then I made it a little bit interactive, so you can scan a little QR code and get a little like, um, little video uh, that you can check out on YouTube as well. Um, but yeah, uh, I mean, I'll read a little bit if, if that's cool, and then and then we can open it up for like questions. And I know Rob, you had some thoughts about some, some things you want to share as well. I did. I'm not actually like writing on the phone. I like, yeah. beat things happening. <laughs> um, so this is a horror um, a horror short story. Um, Again, I, I turned it into a film, it was really fun. Um, but yeah, I'll just read a few pages. Um, Sandy rotated her water bottle in her hand. Her fingers ran along the mushroom sticker while observing a group of people lined up to her right against the warehouse wall. Desperate men and women, the ratty clothes of junkies, the unbathed, a few who seemed like broke college students. A waft of almonds from the line mixed in settled with smells of whiskey and shit and caro made sage cringe. Some say smell develops early in our bodies as we're fetuses. By the time we're toddlers, we can smell hundreds of thousands of smell. For Sadie, it was millions, and it overdeveloped into a hypersensitivity. So while others may cringe at the smell of shit and gas, Sadie knew that the waft of almonds from the line and people were ill, very ill. And the only way for her to cleanse her senses was to guzzle down psilocybin water, so she flipped open the bottle and took a drink. Leaning against the building's cute monster mural in the shapes of multicolored blobs, the beauty of this dry spray paint hit the back of her throat, tore at her esophagus. The bottle rushed to her lips, and she inhaled, knowing that this was the last stop for the day. Her phone buzzed, and she pushed off the graffiti wall, closed the lid, and placed her hand on the bottle's lid. A door at the front of the line popped open, and a woman in her mid-thirties walked out. She had a short blue mohawk and wore a black chef jacket. Labor shortage? No, not really, AJ said. And thank you for making another stop. Anything for a loyal customer, Sadie said. It's actually been the second time this week Sadie's company delivered to her. AJ had gone through a dozen specialty spices in less than a week, so Sadie decided to see the cuisine for herself instead of sending her cousin, one of the runners, to the shipment. She heard about AJ's spot through an upscale client, one with an in-home shelf. AJ's had been one of those underground restaurants she'd always wanted to try but never panned out. She was either too busy or the place was shut down too quickly. But AJ's been, been, been around for a few months now, so whoever she was paying off 
is working. AJ held the door open, and they both entered. Inside the warehouse, Sadie investigated the room. The prep area was flooded with red lights and, uh, and steel counters and wooden walls. Plates of garnishes, herbs, nuts, berries were on the counter. She placed her tote bag on the counter. She took the seat opposite of AJ and stood behind it. What's on the menu tonight? Sadie asked. When one of your newest customers goes through a dozen of your specialty spices in less than a week, you have experience the cuisine for yourself. And with over hundreds of olfactory ingredients combining to create trillions of smells, AJ leaned more heavily on red meat and earthy tones. Every night is different, hence the new spices, AJ said. Well, I think you'll like these new blends, said Sadie promptly, unpacking several bottles of spices from the tote bag. Why so? Well, these are mixed with my personal harvest of golden tops. See, mixing psilocybin and her premium spices was what helped Sadie build out her network. Celebrities, entrepreneurs, politicians who all wanted to feel enhanced dining experience. One could mix shrooms and tea, sure, but that gets boring with time and such earthy tastes. So instead, Sadie would mix in her blend of spices and coriander, thyme, cumin, and fenugreek leaves, and hand out recipe cards for each of her batches. So she's just making them with salads, with acidity, anything to help cut, to help cut out nausea or bitterness. She even figured out a way for a few spice recipes for chicken and pork, as long as it was cooked on low heat to not degrade the psilocybin. So with blood rushing halfway through a meal, the psilocybin would basically taste non-existent while also activating in its advanced state that would offer a heightened feeling of euphoria. Stomachs full, heads in the clouds, and smiles across faces. The itis was on another level, and savings didn't pay. So I'll stop there. Um, you can, you know, pick it up. I'll also have more uh, of the other scenes as well. But yeah, let's um, let's open up for questions that you might have, Rob. And I don't know if you want to set up front. Yeah. I have one question. Before me, mine. Or yeah, if anybody else has any questions. Mine is okay. Well, I didn't know that. Um, we, we were talking outside about the, the notion of the I mean, I'm from the East Coast and probably like Bowery second wave, like 1980, as far as like uh, the DIY culture. And I just remember like the first television single was like 1976, Johnny Jewel, A and B. And it said the address was called Richard Hell, who I'd never heard of to get the single. You know, we used to have singles were always for sale. And I said, I'd like to talk to Richard Hell. And he's like speaking, and I'm like, and I'd already heard the song, I'm like, they're amazing. I hung up, I was afraid of it. But, but it struck me that along with the music, it seemed part of the culture was that there was just a blending and destruction and also collaboration of art, audience, and communication between and among. Like, like if you weren't the one on stage or on the floor that day, you were in the audience and you were in the other place the next day. And it didn't have a whole lot to do with like people being better or worse than each other, which was different than other music scenes that seen. So I, I was just curious, when did, was that part of early zine culture? Did it grow and sort of? Yeah, I mean, I'll chime in a little bit and then love to get your thoughts. But like, as I was kind of showing earlier in the seventies, I think like that's where we started to see the really proliferate, just given like the access to being able to print stuff, I think, given the movement of all the punk rock that was happening, there's still a lot of political stuff, so I think it was just kind of ripe for a lot of these things to get created by artists. Um, but then I know in the 90s, it, it kind of even boomed even more, yeah. so I don't know what kind of thought like, um, like with Kinko's disposable cameras and scissors and Sharpies and glue sticks, yeah. like... Um, like I didn't have money to go to shows and like go see the bands that I wanted to see so I would go to a show and take pictures of the bands ask if I could ask them a couple questions on my little recorder and then I would go home and go to Kinko stay up all night do the whole thing to make a little zine as many as I could and then throw those in my backpack go to the show the next night and sell them out front to the people going into the show for me to get enough money to go into the show too and start the whole fucking thing all over again. And the thing about the culture with it was there were a lot of bands that never would have, no one ever would have heard them outside of their garage if there wasn't somebody going, hey, you are legit. I'm going to put you in this shitty little fucking thing and you're, the pictures aren't even going to come out because the ink's so bad. And, um, but all of these zines would have like 
um, like contact us for whatever in it. And so when bands would come from out of state, they would come and they would usually have zines. And so they would show me and other kids like me the zines that they had where they were from. And so we would send them our zine and then they would send their zine back. And then there were also a lot of zines that would have like an index of other zines throughout the country to where you could like go and get shit. And then everyone who had a band had a zine because that's how they were like hawking their demo tapes for a dollar, you know, like in the back of the thing. So the whole thing became a huge community, which ended up being how bands were able to tour because like we were talking outside, like you would just go to a town where you knew there was a zine. And if there was a zine, that meant there was some sort of scene there and you could like stay at their house or whatever and um, put shows on. So that was like the, it was like the internet before the internet for sure. I have a follow up on that. Like, what what inspired you to like get glue sticks and scissors and a pencil and start talking to folks? Was there something that like inspired you? Mm -hmm. Like, did you see someone else do that? Well, did you like see a zine? Well, somewhere? all the flyers back then were Sharpie, and yeah. someone drew something or took like a a model out of a magazine and taped it to a piece of paper and then made photocopies. So all of us were already doing that for the flyers for our little backyard parties and shit like that. When you would go to like the record store, there would just be like this big shit giant floor it. by the door. It was just like flyer after flyer. So um, that was pretty normal. And then you had like the OC Weekly and the LA Weekly and Scratch. And um, then you had like even the older ones, like, um, like what was it? Scream and Nomag and um, just like all of the more legit zines that like the ones have been around for yeah five and years what, what was what were we calling it um you said it earlier like the i don't know the i mean it's not corporate but they're like oh i could sell ad space mm -hmm. and still do the same fucking thing um yeah, yeah like, you know what I'm like the film about. the film stuff is, is one slash that's the one i was thinking of yeah too um the other thing i was going to mention was um and then rob i love to see if you have any thoughts but like you mentioned something like you would you would basically start trading among zinesters. Mm -hmm. Like today, you can literally just Google like zine fest in California, and there's like a shit ton that are happening, mm -hmm. right? I was just telling Matt like today the the LA Zine Fest, which is a pretty big one in the Arts District, just announced their time uh, in June. So like that's another one to check out. Um, most of them kind of happen together in bunches. Like I know September October is like another one where a bunch of zines yeah. kind of all happen together. Um, but yeah, I don't know what other questions you might have, but if not, does anybody else have any questions? Yeah, go ahead. Um, it's more of a technical question. Uh, so do you guys uh, produce them yourselves, or do you have uh, any like indie printers that can do it for you that like are good? Do you want to well, I always did it myself, but this fucking guy comes <laughs> up with some fucking things. Like, yeah, I had somebody print that. I was like, oh! <laughs> tell me everything tell me everything well, i mean i think the thing was like i printed like the then someone nights ones i printed um like three batches of about 20 mm -hmm. and i kept selling out and i was like this is I, I, it's tedious mm -hmm. tedious as fuck right yeah, yeah. to do that and like i would get them consignment sometimes i would get paid from bookstores sometimes i wouldn't yeah and um sometimes i'd be like well it's in the bookstore i don't know if i'll ever go back and pick it up and i have a couple that have been there for years so then i was like okay let me just let me just see if there's like a local printer um, so I reached out to one and, and, and I was able to like one afford it, um, but as you know, I had him do like a two hundred or one hundred run of my zines, and it was pretty reasonable. It was like, in Bay Area, it was in, Bay Area yeah. in Oakland, and that was pretty reasonable. And I was just like, okay, then I don't have to print these every time. And maybe I'll do another run in like a few years. Because every time I've looked into doing something like that, I, it, it's it's not very cost effective, but at the same time, the more you order, the less the price is. Right. So then you're going, okay, so I'm gonna have boxes and boxes and boxes of yeah, this stuff, yeah. yeah. So. Jackie, uh, Gorgeous did a zine like here. Yeah, it's an awesome zine. Yeah. She did it with a, like a super small mom and pop here in LA, I was curious. Like, yeah, we were talking about it. She wanted some thoughts on how I did mine, and I was like, hey, you should look at a local. Like, if they're, if they're open to doing it, mm -hmm. right? It could be kind of expensive and that's, yeah. I mean, that's like the color, the, this one I did myself. I just did like 15 or 20 of them myself with my own printer, and then um, the insides that are black and white, I printed them at work. Yes. Like, fuck it. Like, like weird mass, <laughs> like, um, all my zines, because I grew up in that Xerox shit, 
are like super high contrast black and white. Yeah. Like when I was doing it. <clears throat> and when I did Weird Mask, I had the high contrast black and white, but then like a really hot pink in it too. And um, when the color thing on my printer broke, I stopped doing Weird Mask. So it, like, <laughs> it lasted like 25 issues and it was so much fun and it was great. But then I'm like, well, I can't do the fucking thing now. So just I'll burn the whole fucking thing down. So, so. if you hire a like printer to do the work, is it like, uh, is it like selling out a little bit? <laughs> Or, I mean, it's like, no. supposed to be okay. So, so here, here's 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 where I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna totally do the whole thing. Okay, so um, zines are they they came from fanzines, but they also came from little magazines when the mimeograph got introduced in the uh, late '50s, I think, for early like for read, readily consumption for everybody. And what you would do, you would take like a transparency and type on the transparency what you want the pages to be, and then you put that down on the paper and run ink over it, oh, yeah, yeah. and they look like shit, but it's amazing, I love it. But um, that was the first way everyone was able to start printing shit. And so all these people started putting out these little magazines to compete with like the big slicks and shit. And that's where a lot of who the 20th century, like our great writers, all cut their teeth on in these little shitty chapbooks and like one you could probably find a lot of if you're ever um, interested in the littles is um, Wormwood Review that lasted from the 60s all through the 90s and that's amazing so if you're interested in that but prior to that <clears throat> you did have the fanzines and Comet but you also started getting um, like distinct fan clubs so like um, Edgar Rice Burroughs who did like the Princess of Mars and um, Tarzan and all that shit in the 30s they started a um, thing for him his fans did and so that fan community came together around that and then in the um, 50s and 60s and 70s you started getting like um, HP Lovecraft fans putting stuff together Robert E. Howard Conan stuff um, Star Trek was huge like there was and that's where like, um, like Forrest J. Ackerman, who um, was the editor of uh, Famous Monsters of Filmland, um, he started doing stuff and started putting on like the first like I wouldn't call them Comic Cons, but like conventions where motherfuckers dressed up and <laughs> would like go hang out, and it was typically like twenty or thirty people at like a hotel bar, yeah. and that was like the whole thing, and then it just like, it was, like the genre of it, which is it totally is, that, and, yeah, like, you know. And I think that's the thing that makes, like, Zine Fest different from all of the things that happened prior. Because everything that was prior, it was so, like, this is about Star Trek. This is about Conan. This is about this. And then, so with the Zine Fest, it just really, like, spread out. And so back to that. Um, but before that, Walt, Walt Whitman um, released Leaves of Grass. Um, on his own. He printed it himself and made it himself and um, was selling that like right after the Civil War. So that was um, his like independently published book. <clears throat> but like D.H. Lawrence was publishing his own stuff. Like all these old timey fucks were doing that. And I mean, like Walt Whitman revised Leaves of Grass like over a hundred times in between like from day one because like he would run out and then oh, I'm going to write it all over again now and do the whole thing <laughs> and um, so there's that but the whole idea of chat book and because like when you think about it zines, chat books, little magazines they're all the fucking same it's just someone putting something out ebooks on Amazon mm -hmm. are all the fucking same it's just someone doing something without somebody telling them they can't fucking do something so the term chat book comes from way back in the day um, there were these salesmen that would go into little villages in England with their little cigarette box thing with little books. And most of the books were like, so if there was like a famous book, this guy would like write like a abridged version that was like 30 pages and would like change the ending if he didn't like the ending. And then would like go walk through town and go, hey, we're selling books here. They're really cheap. Come get them. And um, they, the guy who would sell them somehow or another became known as the Chappie. And that was like what his title was. He would come to town and do this. Yeah. And that's where the whole term like, oh, good chap, good old chap. Like it's oh. be off of that. And cause like, I always thought chapbooks meant like chapter book. Mm -hmm. 
like books you would get like when you were a kid and stuff. But it all comes back to this one little fucking dude going to fucking things. Thomas Paine's Common Sense is kind of a zine. Yeah. Was the most widely read zine mm -hmm. in the country in a largely illiterate culture. Yeah. That would be read in the town square. And, and, and so it's really, I just, there's something really cool that I didn't realize until today. Like, making your own films, we love people who sell their plasma and their left toe and their kidney and mm -hmm. make a film. We love people who do it for plays. We love bands who produce the rec their own records, you know, on a three-track machine, not knowing how to bounce. But in self-publishing, it's been looked down upon by, from the sort of dominance of mainstream publishing that, you know, we needed the winnowers. Mm. And without those, yeah, it becomes democratic, but also a clusterfuck without a, a hierarchical judgment, mm. which is cool and bad. It's interesting. Um, but it seems like this is where the DIY is respected and embraced and a culture in self-publishing in a way it's not when people are trying to make quote-unquote books. Because if, if it ever was cool, the big five wouldn't be able to exist. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> it, it just like, it wouldn't, they, they would have to go, oh shit, we fucked up. Yeah, it's like and, Columbia Records, right? Yeah, exactly. It, it is, thing. but at the same time, like I was showing like Raina or uh, Mari Naomi, like they were doing Zine Fest right. and like, you know, recently, um, a lot of Big Five are like going to Zine Fest to try to find creators and artists because they're starting to realize like there's a groundswell there. Big Three now. Well, then well yeah. just just on like self publishing, I mean, like I'm sure a lot of you heard uh, like Brandon Sanderson left his big fucking awesome deal he had with whatever fucking publisher he had, and he's self publishing his shit now, and he's making fucking millions. It's ridiculous. When I lived in Buffalo, and she was being offered basically a lot of money from labels, and she said. My audience is loyal to me, and I can move 40,000 copies independently, which gets me more money and total autonomy than a gold record would. Mm -hmm. and, and I was like, I admire you so much. That, and you're, you're also more organized than all of them. Yeah. And yeah. The, the other thing yeah, is, like, for real. there's no one way to, to get your work out there, specifically, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Like, Zines is one way. You can go the traditional, like, through a publisher. Sometimes there's crossover. Yeah. Um, but the Zine Fest is just, like, something where get your stuff in front of someone else and you can kind of see the instant reaction. Whether they love it or they hate it, if they have questions, if they want to talk to you about it. And I think that's the really cool thing about ZFest and just making art and being being And put being it able to do it quickly because my yeah. ADD will not wow. allow me to wait a year or whatever for a book to come out. Like I would I would go crazy. Two years. <laughs> Two years, yeah. You know, like I, I can't <laughs> Yeah. I don't think that's that uncommon anymore, though. There was, my friend Leanne was talking about the woman who wrote Pay It Forward that became mm -hmm. a movie. Yeah. She left publishing and does her own books twice a year or something mm -hmm. now. Although leaving publishing is easier to establish a... If you uh, already have an audience. Yeah. ...respect with an audience yeah. than right. having not been... Which is not fair and doesn't mean anything just because you're on Knopf once. You're not right. necessarily more qualified to do a... A zine, you know, but so there is still the weird sort of like that. It's I think it's easier to jump, like I mean, that's in, in, in mass eyes. As it right. I mean, there's there's the business aspect of it, but I think the other thing that I, I don't know if you I'd love to get your thoughts on this, but like every time I go to a zine fest, I'm either trading my zines for other people's zines mm -hmm. and just like in awe of just like things I never even thought I'd fucking see on a piece of paper. Yeah. Right, and I think that's where I get like kind of addicted to that. More than like being so, able to sell myself. Sounds like a very deep yeah. rabbit hole that you could just fall down for almost. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can. And like, I, and most scenes are like one, maybe two days zine fest, and um, they, you know, they're probably like five, six hours, and like it gets fucking tired, like yeah. tiring, staying there selling your stuff, or just kind of like trying to, um, you know, get it promoted in any way. Um, but yeah, you had a question. No, I was just going to ask you guys: Is there? A and it's probably all over the place. And that is, not to be rude, but this will be our last question. Okay. I have to be the time talker. Oh, no, no, it's okay. Like the balance between graphics and text in mm -hmm. a zine. Is it all over the place? Are some of them all over it's the really place. graphic? Some of them are all text? Some of them are all pictures. I got this one from a guy that did um, 3D 
he made like a like an old school like dynamite magazine 3D oh, wow. zine with the 3D glasses oh, wow. and like so that was with the glasses? yeah yeah that's that was funny. fucking amazing but like yeah. like some are just words and like the whole Persian thing like the Persian movement I guess is more of like it's just like personal zine like yeah. people writing poetry because like I think when the zine whole thing started it was supposed to be like more like the little magazines where you had a group of people contributing yeah, to put like, something like together. Anthology. Yeah. And then, um, You're still big in the zine. zine. Yeah. Are totally. there are still zines, zines like yeah. that? that yeah. Are, yeah. Zines yeah zines in fact, cool, um, if you guys want their free, there's blood rags on the table out there. And that's like a poetry zine. I do. That's just like a broadside that has usually six to eight different poets in it. So that's, there's a bunch of different ones out there. They're just in a stack. And, so. and most zine fests, and, and just to conclude, like most zine fests will be like a mishmash of text, mm -hmm. graphics, like weird experimental shit, like the matchbook. Like I've seen different versions of that, mm -hmm. um, collages, etc. It's just a place for people to put their art on an artifact and, and put it in front of their readers. Um, so yeah. Right on. Thank you. Zine. Thank you guys. my um well, it wasn't my interview um that was the thing i did at the place um i listening back to it i got caught up a couple times where like i was exaggerating about something but since you can't like see my face and my hands it just sounds like i'm saying certain things so there's a couple things that um i recommend everybody do their own research on <laughs> If anything I said there sounded sketchy, look it up. My mango delivery will be here momentarily, so I need to wrap this up. So, you know what? I was just going to say, I really want to get Jonas on the podcast to talk about zines and stuff like that. Because he's done a lot of shit, and I should probably hit him up and try to get him on here. Because he was the one who was doing most of the talking on that thing. So anyway... Um, again, what the fuck is happening? It's out now. But first, let's get to those motherfucking shout outs. So I want to give a big thank you to Michael, Cedar, Harry, and Michael over on Patreon. And then at the YouTube Thank You Crew, I want to give a big thank you to Patrick, to Britt, to Jan, to Deb, to Ethan, to Julia, to Nathan, and to Cedar. And then for the big swinging dicks over there in the Anarchy Crew. You guys are awesome. I want to give a big thank you to Nate, to Mindy, to Shaylin, to Tamara, to Adam, to JH, to Michael, to Chasey, and to Lauren. You guys are amazing. And then for the biggest, biggest, heaviest, swingingest, big swinging dick, I want to give a big thank you to Caitlin. You're awesome. Kisses. Um, yeah. So join the crew. Um, if you're on YouTube here, just hit the join button, pick a tier. Uh, we could do mentorship, we could do monthly, we could do weekly. You could just join the Anarchy Crew, or you could just say, you know what, you're awesome and I want to support you because I think you're cool, so I'm going to join the Thank You Crew. If you want to go throw your money away over on Patreon, I'll let you. I don't really do a whole lot there. Most of the stuff I do, I do here um, over on the tubes, unless you're listening to this on a podcast and you don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. So just go over to fucking YouTube and... Um, subscribe at Matt wall do the fucking thing um, I'm racing the clock here Andrea my instacart shopper is less than a block away and she will be texting me because I guarantee she won't know how to get into the building that's just how life is so um, I'm gonna be doing the episode with the Chasey interview like the reverse interview um next so um hopefully i will see you guys over on there so until next time keep eyeing my books type hard and i will talk to you all later just want to give quick thanks to those people who make these videos possible anarchy crew and my followers on patreon i appreciate the hell out of you guys and thank you so much for keeping me going to keep this content possible you guys are awesome and if you'd like to join the crew of the anarchy crew just hit the join button beneath this video and if you'd like to become a member of my patreon you can run over to the link down below to do that as well thank you